We'll get into the Word today. I was realizing this week how much the Word of God cleanses our soul, washing us in the water of the Word of God and just an incredible feeling of being washed in the water of the Word. We're in Acts chapter 26. We're going to finish the chapter, verses 19 through 32, if you need a Bible to follow along. As we go through this text, we see so many things that we can apply to our lives. As, as we see the things that are happening there in the book of Acts, and then we think about the things that happen to us in life, we can connect. It's like, I, I understand that environment because I've, I've seen it, I've experienced through the Word of God. We're with the Apostle Paul after he is arrested and detained by the Roman government. And after two years, he's still in a place of legal limbo, but now appeals his case to Caesar in Rome as the local governor, Festus, tries to write a case against him, and he asks for the political king named Agrippa to help him understand what Paul is about and, and if Paul has broken any Roman or Jewish laws. And we realize there are many things that happen to us in life that are not what they seem on the surface. Many times they have a deeper spiritual work, an implication. And it's certainly the case with the Apostle Paul. As we know, the Lord told Paul that he would go to Rome and be a witness to Jesus there. And yet after two years, Paul is still in, a Rome, in Roman custody in the Judean region of the Middle East. How many times have we thought, Lord, how long? How long will I, I be in this place and my life is slipping away and I no longer have those opportunities and we were ministering to a man this week and say, you've forgotten what's coming next. It's the millennial reign of Christ where you will be a servant of the Most High God and yes, your, your life was shot and wasted away. But now another life is coming the kingdom of Jesus and you're going to fulfill those dreams there I believe it I I'm sure of it and God is now making you way to hear for what's going to happen there doesn't the Bible tell us that but we forget don't we we forget that you know man I'm 62 years old and bad health my life is gone no it's not it's just beginning. The eternal life in God. There are many things that are not what they seem on the surface. Remember that. All the while, God is working behind the scenes here in Paul's life and in our life as well with an eternal purpose. We, we see with Paul, he was able to, to minister to the local authorities there, the regional ruler, which is King Agrippa II. And uh, King Agrippa had a background in the study of the Jewish scripture through the heritage of his family. And God was working, not only here, but in our lives as well. We may not get to stand before kings and rulers, but we got to talk to two guys here at the church yesterday about Jesus. And it was for such a time as this. I just happened to be there, got finished up with some chores, and was able to share with them because I was here. Telling them about Jesus, I don't think they wanted to follow Jesus, but since they were on this property... I took full opportunity, gave him some water, and said, let me tell you my story. And they, they could have left, but they heard the whole thing. So we get the opportunity in, those, in our life, just like Paul did here. So as Paul is called before the king of the northern province, along with the Roman governor, Festus and the prominent men of the city along with the military commanders. We ended our last section in verse 18 with Paul explaining to them and uh, his life and how Jesus 
appeared to him. And he gave this testimony. That Jesus gave him this commission to go to the Gentiles or the non-Jewish people of the region and tell them about Jesus, which Jesus said would open their eyes, turning them from spiritual darkness to the light of God. And isn't that what Jesus does? Think of how many of us were blind to realities before we came to Christ. Or was it just me? I mean, I was so blind to the realities of creation and truth. And Jesus opened my eyes, and I know he opened your eyes as well. Turning us from spiritual darkness to the light of God. From the power of Satan to God. And that we could receive the forgiveness of sins through Jesus, inheriting eternal life with all those who choose by faith to believe or trust in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here in verse 19, Paul continues his message to King Agrippa along with the king's sister Bernice, who history says she, he was married to. Ew. And Governor Festus, with all the important people, must be a cultural thing, right? All the important people that were gathered there at the judgment hall at Caesarea. And Paul says, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do the works fitting or befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. <clears throat> Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand witnessing both to small and great saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses <clears throat> said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, to ascend to glory with God in that context, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Think of the light that Jesus has brought to our lives. If you've experienced that enlightenment, you are a very privileged human being on this earth in this day and age because it's dark and getting darker. Paul was convinced that Jesus was alive. It didn't take a rocket scientist to figure that one out as Jesus spoke to him as he laid on the ground with that light shining around him. He was convinced that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah, of which Paul would have known much about through his study of the Jewish scriptures, foretelling of the coming Messiah to God's people. When I study those prophecies, I'm shocked that when Jesus stood before that group of Jewish religious um, rulers, that they just didn't fall on their face immediately and say, Oh God, forgive us. They knew the scriptures. Paul knew the scriptures, but they were blind. They were blinded by religion and their pride and their selfishness in life like all of us. And they needed Jesus just as much as we do. Everyone does. Paul was convinced Jesus was the Messiah. Paul knew a lot about the Messiah before he ever realized Jesus is the Messiah, which was confirmed to Paul as Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus as Paul was going there to persecute followers of Jesus, totally blind to the truth of God, and yet he knew God but was blind to the truth of God. Later, he would write, there are people that are zealous for the things of God, but without knowledge. 
We see that in the world today, wherever religionism is, <clears throat> wherever works for righteousness are, zealous for God, but ignorant of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It really touches my heart when I see people that I know are zealous for God, but they don't know God and how we need to be gentle and loving with them. Although sometimes I'm not. And I get angry with myself, especially when people come to the door and they give you these little pamphlets and they're full of lies about God. And I, I get angry. I say, you need to read your Bible and stop teaching people lies. <clears throat> and my wife says, I hope they don't know you're the pastor of a church. <laughs> I go, oh, I always need to pray before I talk to those guys because I... I'm just not a very loving, kind person, I guess. So Paul understands that the Messiah has come to open blind eyes. His eyes were open, right? It's so ironic. He was blinded by the light, but yet his eyes were opened, right? So we know that's a spiritual blindness. It's an intuitive, perceptional blindness that can happen to any of us. Paul knew that, that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew why he came. To open blind eyes, to turn people from spiritual darkness to the light of God. And from the power of Satan to hold people in bondage to the power of God that sets people free from the bondage of sin, and which is the power of the devil. Paul declares the proper response to that truth is repentance, which simply means to turn from or change one's mind about what they're doing or what they're thinking, in Paul's case, what he thought about God, to change our mind. It could be one of the best words in all of the Bible. I think of how many times that I've had to come to repentance as a believer in Christ, changing my mind about a personal attitude or maybe something I thought and God revealing the truth to me. And I said, God, I repent of that. Now, that wasn't right. I, it wasn't loving. It wasn't kind. Help me, O oh God. And in that place of repentance, it's a position of humility which justifies God in helping idiots like me. It's a sure-fired way to get God's help. Repentance. Turning now to the reality of the one true living God who is just and righteous. Which Paul knew from the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures describe and declare the nature of God to mankind as God's word in the Old Testament which the Jews call the law and the prophets. It reveals the just and righteous nature of God to anyone who wants to know. And that's why we study the Old Testament of the Bible. To know God. To understand righteousness and justice. It also helps us with parenting. It helps us with interaction with others. The Old Testament is valuable to us because we can see the heart and the nature of God. But you have to ask. When I read through passages in the Old Testament, I'm like, show me your heart here because it looks like this, but I know something else is there. And God does that through the Holy Spirit, which many times brings us to repentance. And as God reveals himself to human beings in the New Testament through his son, Jesus, the Messiah, or Christ, we can now not only know God, but now we can see God from the New Testament of the Bible. Yeah, it's true. Jesus puts a face on God. As Jesus said to his disciples, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because the Father and I are one. And then you got to know that big smile was on his face, right? He's just a big smile. The Father and I are one. It's okay. Stop trembling. I've come to you that you might know the truth, and the truth would make you free. 
Ooh, it's true. We certainly see Jesus in the descriptive sense through the New Testament writers that lived with Jesus. They knew him well. They looked upon Jesus physically and actually touched him, as John tells us. We touched him. We beheld his glory. The glory that of only the Father, full of grace and truth. So Paul knew God. That wasn't the problem. Paul knew what God was about. He just didn't know the Messiah. But he does now. Paul knew what the Gentile or the non-Jewish world was about. He came from that, that Greco-Roman world in Tarsus. He knew what these men that stood before him were about. And yet Paul didn't judge them. He didn't chide them for their immoral, godless lives. He just spoke of the truth of God to them. The truth that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies and he's the Messiah. And that anyone who says they know God must walk with God in righteousness and in justice. And of course, we know that comes through Jesus, right? And it was for this, Paul says in verse 21, that the Jews had seized him at the temple and wanted to kill him because Paul declared that Jesus was the Messiah that was foretold by the Jewish prophecies from the Old Testament. It was true. And notice Paul says he obtained help from God there, referring to being seized from the Jews by the Roman commander and put in custody. You might be in protective custody right now. Where God has got you in a place for two years or more. And it's, he's protecting your life. He's doing something eternal there. It's interesting. He says that he obtained help from God by being arrested. I actually had that happen to me in 1986. I was arrested to protect me from myself. <laughs> so I know all about God's protective custody. We can easily see these things that Jesus fulfilled by the work of God, a miraculous work of God to come and fulfill prophecy. Did you know that God has seen your life? Every detail. He knows who you're going to talk to tomorrow. So you have a prophetic life as well. When this was revealed to me, I thought, oh my, I think I'm going to talk to God tonight about tomorrow. Because I want to be ready. I want to serve God with my life. And he's seen my tomorrow. And he's going to get me ready for it tonight. Does that excite you? Yes. It did me, thinking, because I've always been somewhat on the mystic side, even though it was full of demonology. But I thought, wow, this is mystic. God has seen my life and knows what I'm going to do. And he can prepare my heart. And he can reveal these things to me ahead of time. I love to pray about things before I go to bed at night. Enigmatic, pro problematic things. And I wake up going, and sometimes the answer is right there. I saw one this morning as I turned to Isaiah and I went, it's right there. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. It's right there. God wants to work in our lives that way <clears throat> and in the lives of others. As we think of the over 300 prophecies concerning the life, death, and resurrection of the Messiah, who we call the Christ, and how we can systematically verify from history these prophecies were fulfilled with, with Jesus and those eight that are on the screen are ones that he had no control over. Because people say, well, Jesus knew the prophecy. He could just go do that. And I go, oh, really? How about where he was born? <clears throat> the time he was born. The manner in which he was born. 
How about his betrayal? The manner of his death? The people's reactions? All prophesied from the word of God. Verified. A piercing of his side. Now that was a trick. His burial. His resurrection. Psalm 16.10 talks about how he will not see corruption, but see life. It was all prophesied in God's word. Those Jews knew it. They just didn't know him. Same problem today. Many people believe in God, but they just don't know him. And they can only know him through Christ, and that needs to be our message. Our lives are uh, just a continued process of knowing him. Therefore, I have a theory that in heaven, we're going to spend a gazillion years just getting to know God. All of what God is, how he does things. And it's just going to be amazing. Never a boring day there, for sure. Never a day where you're like, oh, God. I can't believe it's already 5 a.m. <laughs> Happens to pastors a lot, I tell you. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, wow. We are overwhelmed with the absolute way God has foretold, fulfilled, and revealed these prophecies through the life of Jesus. Just overwhelmed by it. Leaving no doubt in the human mind or logic that this Jesus is the Messiah. And if we wonder if it's so absolute, then why do so many people reject the truth of it? We have to realize most people reject this truth without really even investigating whether it is true or not. And that all begins with asking God. He has no problem revealing himself to human beings. If he needs to, he can show up like just amazing things where I like the small, still voice method myself. I think I might have a bad heart and the flashing angels might freak me out from my past, you know. <laughs> wow, what a trip, dude. <laughs> it's like God says, no, we don't do that with you guys. <laughs> you know. <laughs> We realize most people reject this truth without ever putting out any effort to rationally validate whether it could be true or not. They listen to the skeptics of God. That's never a good way to get good information, is listening to somebody that's obviously against it. Well, of course, you're going to get a biased opinion. Simple logic tells us that. Many people believe the lie that there is a God in heaven and he will just wave his hand and forgive us without a price paid to justify the sin and to justify the judge. I tell him which judge is righteous that just simply lets the world's worst criminal go. That's not just. So now you're saying God is going to do that? That's not rational. A price was paid for us to go to heaven through Jesus Christ. I think sometimes this might have been the case with <clears throat> Governor Festus, along with city leaders and military present, because sometimes people, when they have security and social standing and... and you know, power and influence, they think they've been blessed by God to be in that place. I'm doing pretty well, and they ignore the truth what's in their soul. That they will stand before God someday in judgment. In fact, those people in those elite places are often more accountable to God because Jesus said, to whom much is given much will be required. So be careful when you idolize those people that have much because they also have a heavy burden. Another reason Jesus told us is that people are not willing to let go of their sin even though they'll absolutely say 
the light is in the world. Even though, as Paul says here, the light has come into the world. And we think of King Agrippa. Even though he knew of the prophecies, he had heard of the life of Jesus and the power of sin over his life would keep him from coming to this light as far as we can tell from our record here. And as Paul declares these truths to this body of social elites, we somehow realize it was not Paul that was on trial that day. It was them. They would be on trial before God as the truth of God witnessed by the Holy Spirit was given and they would now be responsible to God for that light that was given to their life to either accept or reject the truth that they knew was the truth in their soul, their inner conscience. There is a God in heaven. And this guy is saying, God made a way for sinners to be saved. But I have to repent. They were given the gospel that day in a different way. And as that tension built there, it almost, I almost feel from the text that as Paul ended verse 23 that there was a pause and a, a real awkward silence. As this tension built in their heart, it finally shatters there. Verse 24, as we continue, Now as Paul thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, or he shouted, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason for the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner King Agrippa do you believe the prophets I know that you believe then Agrippa said to Paul you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am except for these chains. And when he had said these things, the king stood up, ending the hearing, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them and when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or imprisonment, which is signified by the chains. And then Agrippa said to Festus, You've got a big problem. This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. We see here that Festus, the Roman governor, just can't take it anymore. He interrupts Paul with this inappropriate outburst saying, you're beside yourself. It's much learning about Jesus is driving you mad. But Paul calmly and respectfully answers, I am not mad, but I speak the words of truth and reason, which would appeal to this commander. These Roman commanders were highly educated. They were often very caring compassionate people, the governors. They, they were trained to care about people in a political sense because if mama ain't happy, nobody happy. You know, we all know that one, right? So he's saying, I'm appealing to you with truth and reason. Paul knows that the Holy Spirit is in their soul in, in a sense of, of convicting them of their lives before God. He knows that because it happened to Paul. He understands this is taking place. And the king knows, and the king can verify the truth of Jesus as well. I think Paul is inviting him to do that because the king heard and watched all these things take place there in Judea, which was done openly. It was recorded in their civil history. And I think here we see 
a great picture of the natural man that just can't take the truth of God and screams out in frustration without any logic or reason. I'm sure you've had that happen as you tell somebody about Jesus and finally they just look down and shake their heads and say, you know, I just can't take this anymore. You, just, I, you can't preach at me. I, I don't believe this and I think you're a nutcase for believing this too. That's going to be fairly common. It happens here in the text. It's a picture of a lot of people in this world today they are trapped in their humanistic logic or their understanding and they're separated from the truth of God by the Holy Spirit or, or, or without the Holy Spirit, just as Paul would declare to the church at Corinth. The Holy Spirit, Jesus said, is in the world convicting. I like to use the word convincing people that, of their need for a Savior. We have the Holy Spirit in us convicting and teaching and showing us things. But the Holy Spirit is in the world, and don't forget that. The person you meet downtown or wherever it may be, that door opens, that's the Holy Spirit. Don't lose that opportunity. Tell them about Jesus. If they say, like these guys yesterday, well, you know, I'm just not ready for that. And I go, well, remember this. Tomorrow is not promised to you. And they were like, whoa. <laughs> the natural man. Well, the man without the Holy Spirit of God cannot discern the things of truth of the Spirit of God, Paul said in 1 Corinthians. That this person literally cannot know these things because they are of the Spirit of God. Well, what do we do then? How did we get that knowledge? We asked. I'm trusting today that you asked. There was a time in your life when you said, God, I need you. That's a way of asking. And you said, God, I, there's got to be more. You were asking. And Jesus said, keep on asking, right? Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. All they have to do is ask. So this tells me, here's what I need to share with them. You know that Jesus is real. Agrippa. No, don't, don't call him Agrippa. I just, you, know. you know that Jesus is real. Just ask. Begin to pray. And I can help lead you in that prayer right now. I've had people say, okay. And I know God's going to begin to work in their lives and show them the truth because he loves them. It's not his will that any would perish. God loves them so much. He's going to do everything in his power to reveal the truth to them through the Spirit, through the things they see in life, the conditions they're in. So we say, let's just ask God. Write that one down today because you're going to meet somebody this week. Just ask him if they will pray. Ask him if you can pray with them because people oftentimes... They're, they're so separated from God, they, they don't even, they can't seem to pray. So I, I lead them in that prayer. All they have to do is ask. This is a way of humbling ourselves before God by asking for the truth. And Jesus said, it would be given. But it's the pride of man that separates them from the truth of God. Always remember that. Whenever the work of God is not <clears throat> flowing and moving ahead in our life, it's because of our pride. The pride of life, John said, by the Spirit. It's that old nature that thinks, I'm okay. I know what I need to know. The other, I don't need to grow in these things. That's pride. Because we have a creator, remember? The word creator means... You were made by God, and he knows you. And he has amazing things for the rest of our lives. We never get there until we're with him. we got to make a t-shirt. We never get there until we're with him. Notice there, Paul puts his laser focus on Agrippa. 
and directly challenges him in his knowledge of the Jewish scriptures in regards to what the prophets declared about the Messiah. How many people do we meet that say, oh, I read the Bible. Th at that point, that's where we shift our mode and now we have a laser focus. God, what do you want to do here? This person just admitted they are accountable before you. Changes the whole spiritual atmosphere. And we can get very bulldogish at that point. But only if we love them. Only if we're doing that. Because we really love them. Paul loved Agrippa. And these men that stood there. He knew how much Jesus loved them. Paul, it seems, knew that Agrippa was intrigued by the idea of the Messiah and was probably wondering, like everybody else, is Jesus of Nazareth the Messiah? That's what people were asking at that time. As no doubt Agrippa had heard the reports that Jesus had indeed rose from the dead three days after he was crucified on a Roman cross at Jerusalem. Anyone that had witnessed a crucifixion, I've just read about them. And I can tell you, if they rose from the dead after that, that was God. Could it be true? How could we know? Again, by simply asking. And I tell people, ask Jesus. He's alive. He'll meet you on that road. But don't be surprised if you're on the ground when he talks to you. Jesus had declared his life to Paul in one sentence. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. That's all it would take. We also know from the writings of Paul that there's a deep instinctive understanding or knowledge. We call it an intuitive knowledge in all human beings that God exists and is real. Romans chapter 1. And that the law of God is programmed into our DNA or the human heart or the conscience the human conscience, even to the point a human would have to willfully suppress that truth in their own unrighteousness and propagate that personal unrighteousness before others in life to justify that unrighteousness in them. Romans chapter 2, starting in verse 14. Man, I think of the understanding that God gives us from his word. We would never know that unless God would reveal it through Paul writing to the church at Rome, thinking about the human condition. God has it figured out, you know. We don't have to wonder why people do what they do. We just have to find a way to tell them the answer is Jesus. Paul knew that Agrippa had explored these things, which is a way of asking in a sense. And each time we open our Bibles and, and we read the Word of God, we're asking. Remember that. We are asking, asking to know God. And each time we are presented with something unrighteous and we say, no, that, that's unrighteous, it's against the nature of God. We are telling God we want His righteousness. We also know that the righteousness of God is given to us through believing in Christ. So positionally, we are totally righteous before God by believing in Jesus. But practically, day by day, we're faced with unrighteousness, it seems like, at every turn. Through our selfishness, through our lack of foresight and understanding, and yet all we have to do is tell God, I think I need a little more Holy Spirit here. Can I get some Holy Spirit on that steak that Isaac was talking about? <laughs> you know, I need some more Holy Spirit in my life. Amen. Just ask. Ask. As we turn to things that are true and righteous, we're telling God, I want your way in my life. Don't ever forget that. 
When you turn to dark, evil things, you are telling the spirit realm you want Satan to rule over your life. Don't forget that. We talk to the spirit realm by what we do in life. Don't forget it. It's serious. Paul knew that Agrippa had this knowledge, and yet Agrippa had chosen to follow the path of unrighteousness. As we see in verse 28, we witness one of the saddest conditions of all mankind. As Agrippa pushes off the conviction of the truth and says, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. With the key word there being almost. Which the context, which has been somewhat uh, argued over by scholars, seems to be somewhat verified by Paul's response that he would to God that they would all be almost and even persuaded to yield to the truth of God, giving us the context of Agrippa's statement, in my opinion. That God so loved the world that he gave the one and only Son of God to save whoever would put their trust in God's plan of salvation for mankind. And even if we don't understand the dynamics or the engineering of salvation, we know that we need a Savior. Agrippa knew that he lived an unrighteous life. And he just rejected the only way out. It's so sad. So many people that have become almost Christians, not fully committed to the things of God, almost committed, almost a Christian. People that agreed with or assented to the idea of Christianity but never committed their hearts to Jesus in faith. It's not like those people who told Jesus they wanted him to be their Lord and Savior and they proved that to themselves by yielding their lives to the nature of God by simply following God's word. And no, it's not a performance or a works trip. This is the word of God. And when Jesus says, I want you to forgive, we should say, yes, Lord, instead of, but you don't know what they've done to me. You don't know the pain I've suffered. You don't know. And whenever we say that to God, we have to check ourselves before we wreck ourselves. <laughs> that was one I learned from Pastor Isaac years ago. It's one of these days I'm going to be just as cool as Pastor Isaac. <laughs> Without the beard. There are so many almost Christians. Almost believers. You almost persuade me. Coming so close but never entering in because they didn't enter by faith. Proving to themselves they were believers. So many that heard the truth of Jesus and put off that commitment to follow him. And the devil came and stole that word, that seed out of their hearts in some fashion. And it became a religious fallacy deep inside. They're compromised in their faith. You know, the message to those people is Jesus knows and understands and he wants you to return. He wants you to know that this has never been about what you do. It's about what he's done. Amen. He wants to reveal that truth to the world over and over. Today, you might think that you could be one that's almost a Christian. You know deep inside that there's not that full commitment and you don't know what to do about it. You know, you go to church, you read your Bible, but you know it's not there. The key is yielding your life to him. In whatever he presents to you, and I'm going to tell you, God's word is full of it. 
It tells us exactly what he wants us to do. Doesn't leave anything out. Oftentimes folks say, but you know, I'm just waiting to hear from God. I say, just go back and do what he already said and he'll take care of it. Go back and do what he said now. And if you need help seeing those things, that's what pastors and elders are for, to, to evaluate your life and, and your spiritual walk with God, not to criticize or tear down, but to edify and build up in the faith. Because we know where Jesus wants you to be. We know where we want to be. And because we're not there, we can't tell you to be there. We can just say, let's go. Let's go there. Let's go there every day, asking, trusting, believing. And that's the process. Today, if you, you feel that you might not be there, that you're almost a Christian, you can tell Jesus that now. You know, even in the privacy of your own heart. And, and I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment to raise your hand if you want us to pray for you. You may know that you're not a Christian here today. And you don't know what's, what's kept you back. And today we want to pray for you because it all begins with asking. And let him show you the rest. He can do that. Because last time I checked... He's God. Almighty God the Son. He's the Holy Spirit who works in our hearts and He's God the Father that made it all happen because of His love. I want to ask the music ministers to come as we prepare to close. We notice that Paul wanted these important men to be like he was, except for the chains, of course which implies they had nothing that Paul wanted. Not social status, not monetary status. He wanted them to have what he had, fully accepted as a son of God. If you're not sure that you've come to that salvation in Christ, you can tell him today, you can ask him today. Paul didn't want what they had. Paul wanted them to have what he had. The riches of God by Christ. The knowledge of God through Christ. The assurance of eternal life in Christ. We realize at this point, Paul was the richest man in that judgment hall. And he wasn't being judged at all. If you've received the truth of Christ in faith, then you're like Paul hopefully without the chains. But many believers have fallen into bondages through that old nature. They've let things creep in and now there's a deep bondage that Jesus fully knows and understands. And the only way it can continue is if you continue to hide it from him. It can only be exposed through, through humility and prayer that you go to church leaders that you can trust and say, man, I've got a big problem. And we say, let's bring it into the light. The light will purify it. The truth of God will drive it out. He's never stopped loving you. His heart's been breaking for you this whole time. He's waited for this moment that you could come to him in truth. He who the Son sets free is free indeed. Jesus wants that for our lives. And today, if you've never accepted Christ, you want us to pray for you. You can slip up your hand. We want to pray for you today. We want you to know the truth of God. If you feel like you're not sure about any of these things, you just slip up your hand. We want to pray for you today. We want to ask with you. You may need help asking. If you're a Christian that's in bondage to things in life, you can, you can just say, Jesus, that's me. We both know what the deal is here, and I want to be free. You've given me a church body here that understands these things, and they work for you. They have your wisdom and your love through the Holy Spirit, and they can lead me to the place to get it done. Through the power of God, that's how we all got set free, right? If you're living a compromised life or you know you're not where God wants you to be, you can just, you can slip up your hand or you can pray and 
Say, God, I know that's me. Help me, please. Ask him. Continue to ask him day by day. Let's stand together. Lord, I pray for those this morning that have responded to those invitations. You know and see them. I ask that you'd, you'd move in their hearts in powerful ways to verify your reality once again to them. And they would realize how good you are. It's God's goodness that leads us to repentance. It's his kindness that leads us to that place that you can heal us in a spiritual way even today. So we trust you for it now because you are good, Lord. We want you to be the king of our heart. Bless your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. going to give up on us. You will never give up on us. you today. You are hope and our strength. You are healer. You are the light. And you will bring your light to us. You began a work and you're faithful. You're faithful to complete that work in us. Conforming us to the image of Christ. What a work. God, we bless you for it today. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said amen. amen. And give him praise. Give him praise this morning. Yes, Jesus.